But Friday morning, now this is still Ecclesiastes, okay? This is, uh, you've heard this, okay? I'm, I'm probably beating it to death now. Well, I, I didn't make up the text. So this is so famous, okay? You all know this text. He says, there is, a, see, it almost a sense of determinate, determinism. Almost a sense that everything is fixed as opposed to alive and explosive in, in, in newness and refreshment. In one way, I loved his existentialist, dramatic, dramatic bite. But I also know it's not the whole story. A century after this, you have Christ. With Christ, everything is transformed because he transforms death. See? He rises. Here's what he says. There is an appointed time for everything, a time for everything under the heavens. No, this is famous. You know all these lines. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot the plant. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. Yeah, it's all true. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to bar from it, far uh, to be far from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Now here's the bite. He's right about everything he just said, but watch it. This is the bite. What advantage has the worker from his toil? I have considered the task that God has appointed for the sons of men to be busy about. He has made everything appropriate to its time and has made has put the timeless into their hearts without man's ever discovering from beginning to end the work which God has done. And the key line is he has hope, he has made everything appropriate to its time and has put the timeless, the eternal, into their hearts without man's ever discovering. He may not even know it from beginning to end, the work which God has done, that God has put into us the eternal. But see, I think if you want my three cents, two cents, penny and a half, see, with this... There's a, Greek, there's a Greek element to this very, to my mind, very strongly because Plato in the fourth century BC was saying, uh, describing the eternity of, the, the eternal order of truth. And I think maybe there's, it's in the air they're breathing. See, he's put the timeless into their heart. That's Plato. Without man's ever discovering it from beginning to end, the work which God has done that our lives are replete with eternity. We are not condemned to mere passage. The good we do, the love we have, is eternal, even if we don't experience it. It is not void. We are not mere passage, creatures condemned to passage, that we are we're creatures called by God to be eternal, given that we are called to be eternally everlasting. That what we do now is personally, eternally valuable. Personally, meaning we will be the persons of eternity. As Christ rose from the dead, we will too. And all that we have done all that we all that we have achieved, especially in terms of love, will rise with us. And we will be together, as my aunt had said, in paradise, sharing forevermore the goodness of God, the goodness of creation, the goodness of love itself. That's a powerful thought. That's a powerful thought. I heard it held not mine, but a certain meaning I didn't make it up. It's the beauty of faith and hope is that we can embrace life for whatever it is, but with the hope 
that what is accomplished in life will be immortalized eternally in a paradisal state where there is no more loss, no sadness, only love and life itself. You know, I, I don't know who's who you guys are listening to this and watching. The friends that I do know are not my age, a little younger than me, but it's hard not to be, when you get past your 50s and pushing into your 60s and me and my 80s, you, one of the things you know is how, how life is passing because you've already buried the generation older than you. Death is so real. And you feel your own passage, your own skills diminishing. You you feel that your you feel your own mortality in the flesh. You see, yeah. When I see a young scholar is coming on board, I know I will never be a young scholar again. You know, it's like a ball player. You know, you're not going to be a rookie again. You had your turn. Now you can become, in a sense, a seasoned player but not a young player. And so hopefully we become wise and grateful and bringing, in, in bringing completion to our life in a worshipful manner, in a grateful manner. I am so grateful for the life I've been given that I have been blessed with the people of my life. I've had a marvelous life, a wonderful life. I remember one of the old monks said to me, this is 50 years ago, I was... I think I was still in student life. I think it's 55, six, maybe even 60 years ago. It's an old timer. And he said to me, life owes me nothing. That's one of the few quotes I can remember so vividly. And I say the same, life owes me nothing. I have had love, joy, success, failure, sadness. I have grieved and I grieve, but I have rejoiced in love and life. It owes me nothing. It's been an exciting adventure beyond my wildest imagination. That's the truth. It's been an adventure of grace and mystery, adventure. Who'd have thought? <laughs> Who'd have thought ah, that it would ever turn out this way with me? And yet it did. I wouldn't have counted it. Me, a college professor, you have to be with my friends from New Haven to see, to see it because. I am a mystery to so many because you had to know I was the dumbest of the gang. I really was the dumbest, okay? And I ended up being a college professor. <laughs> and I remember Barb Augustinelli saying, I want to, Barb Sugar, who now married me. She couldn't quite frame it because it was, she wasn't criticizing, she was applauding me. But you got to, I think it was Barbara, I'm almost sure it was. It was just, I, she was telling her daughter. Okay? Anyway, it just shows you how God calls us in various ways. He called me to the priesthood, and then he called me to religious life, to passionist. And in the passionist life, because of the love and the, and the, the direction and all that went with it in the community, I discovered myself. That wasn't the dumbest kid on the block that I actually had gifts. And then the order just fostered those gifts and sprung me loose. What a marvelous life I've had, a marvelous career. Even the parish here at St. Mark's, who used to be St. Tim's, 53 years in the parish, and I, unofficial, I'm not on the books. <laughs> I've been there 53 years, four generations. And I hope I, hope I can spend the rest of my life in, here in St. Louis with the university and the parish. I want to be, when I die, I want to be, as it were, mourned at the parish. What's the word? Grieved, whatever you call it. And then shipped back east. I want to be buried with my family with the Passionists. But I hope I will be here the rest of my life. But we'll see. We'll see. But if I think of what a gift life has been for me, God's providential love for me, and the greatness and generosity of the order. It took such mediocrity and converted it to excellence. You have to know what the order did for me. They saw raw talent, where all I saw was raw. And they parlayed it for me. They guided me, encouraged me, transformed me. 
I hope I have honored the order by my life of service. I hope that CP after my name will never be forgotten at SLU, at the university, or anywhere else that I have been. Not just me, but the order. <laughs>